Ukraine surprises the world, storming into Russia by ground and air, taking hundreds of Russian soldiers prisoner. What is the goal? We look at this stunning new development with two leading Catholic voices in Ukraine. Abortion is on the ballot this fall in yet more states, as the green light is given to so-called right to abortion ballot initiatives. We have details. No matter what, we're there for them, we're praying with them. We are part of the service. Why these Catholic high school students are assisting as pallbearers in the funerals of strangers. And do you remember this Olympic legend? Reflections on this summer's Paris Olympics from former Olympian Dominique Dawes and how Mother Angelica inspires her. EWTN News In Depth starts now. General Sersky reported on the completion of the liberation of the town of Sudza from the Russian military. A Ukrainian military commandant's office is being established there. Several other settlements have also been liberated. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky announces his troops have seized a strategic Russian town of 5,000 people. It's the latest good news for the war-torn nation whose incursion into Russian territory has flipped the script on its war with Russia. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth, I'm Catherine Hadro. Ukraine's surprise cross-border attack into Russia was a plan steeped in secrecy, unknown to its allies and analysts, hidden even from the Ukrainian soldiers who were about to carry it out. And in a stunning turn of events, this unexpected move has put Russia on the defense. There is no light, no connection, no water. There is nothing. It's as if everyone has flown to another planet and you are left alone. More than 100,000 Russians flood their homes this week as Ukraine's military operation in Russia presses on. Now in the incursion's second week, Ukraine continues to gain ground in enemy territory, claiming it has captured hundreds of square miles, dozens of towns, and more than 100 Russian soldiers. Russia is struggling to gain its footing to fight back and reclaim its territory. So this is really big because nobody has invaded Russian space, Russian territory since the Second World War. Reports of Ukrainian soldiers on Russian territory began appearing on Tuesday, August 6. But Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky did not acknowledge the attack until days later. Ukraine is proving that it really knows how to restore justice and guarantees exactly the kind of pressure that is needed. Pressure on the aggressor. The incursion comes after Ukraine spent months on the defensive, and its previous counteroffensive last year ended in failure. It's the first time Ukrainian forces have pushed into Russian territory in the two-and-a-half-year conflict, a shift from its former strategy of targeting Russia with drones and missiles. Kyiv says it launched the attack to better protect its eastern land from Russian strikes. But its other goals for the operation remain unclear. There are theories they want to grab some land so that if there's a, a peace agreement that eventually they can trade, they're act, obviously taking uh, prisoners of war and they can trade those. Um, there's also the idea that they want to embarrass Putin. And I think that that could be part of it, you know, changing the narrative with this really outrageous uh, uh, military step by Ukraine. Since August 6, Ukraine has hit key command infrastructure in the Kursk region. The attack seemed to catch the Kremlin by surprise. The fact that they were able to just kind of walk over the border, Russian intelligence didn't appear to be working on this, or if they picked anything up, they seemed to have ignored it. President Putin called it a large-scale provocation. It appears that the enemy is aiming to improve its negotiating positions in the future. Well, what kind of negotiations can we even talk about with people who launch indiscriminate strikes on civilians, on civilian infrastructure, and try to create threats to nuclear energy facilities? What can you talk to them about? According to Kyiv, Russia has started pooling reserves from Ukraine's battleground regions to cover the incursion. While it's unclear how this offensive could impact the broader war, it highlights a shift in morale on both sides.
They've been able to give a tremendous morale boost to the Ukrainians who have been now fighting for two and a half years. And they've caused a major embarrassment to Vladimir Putin back at home. And, you know, now the Russian people are saying, hey, Vladimir, look what you've gotten us into now. I mean, now they're attacking us on our home field. This is a tremendous development. And so I, I applaud the Ukrainians for being able to pull this off. To help us understand the significance of Ukraine's bold counteroffensive and to provide an update on how Ukrainians are faring more than two years into the war, we go to Ukraine. Archbishop Boris Gudziak is the head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in the United States and president of the board of Ukrainian Catholic University. He is currently visiting the university ahead of the academic year. And Dr. Yuri Pidlizny, he is the chair of the political science department at the Ukrainian Catholic University and former deputy governor of the Lviv region. Thank you both for being here. Your Excellency, I want to go to you first. According to Vatican News, the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Perilin, expressed concerns about Ukraine's recent military advances, warning it could further escalate the war and open new fronts. Do you share those concerns? Well, I'm not a mid military strategist, and uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, we clergy are uh, expected to comment on military strategy. What I would say is that Ukraine is in uh, a very clear position. It's really black and white. Uh, every three, uh, over the last 300 years, every time there's been a Russian occupation of any Ukrainian territory, Ukrainian Catholic Church has been wiped out. Mm. We've suffered uh, genocide at the hands of Russians historically. I think all our viewers and listeners remember that what happened in Bucha, Irpin, Borodyanka, Izum, where the mass graves were found, 20,000 ch uh, children were abducted out of occupied territory. Women are raped. Young men are conscripted into the Russian army to kill their own brothers and sisters. Ukrainians have no choice but to defend themselves. Mm. And, um, they're very grateful to Americans and Catholics who stand with them, who pray, who inform, as you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Many journalists have given their lives uh, for, uh, for the truth coming out of Ukraine. Uh, and, of course, there needs to be defensive help. Mm. Yuri, can you explain the weight of Ukraine's recent military advances? Many are saying this incursion could change the trajectory of the war. What's your take on that? Actually, it is changing the trajectory of the war. Uh, actually, to react to your question concerning the position of Pietro Parolin, the State Secretary of Vatican, we were taught all along the uh, war that if the Western countries will supply Ukraine with some weaponry, there will be escalation of the conflict. If, for example, Ukraine will get American HIMARS or F-16, there will be escalation. But you see no escalation until this time. And I'd like to tell you more. What does it mean to escalate the war? Mm -hmm. Russians came and are killing and murdering Ukrainians. And we have no choice but to fight to survive. Mm. And our incursion, for example, into neighboring regions of Russia, which but in, in fact were populated always by Ukrainian speaking uh, population, uh, it is our unique chance maybe to redirect the line of front toward northeast, I mean toward mm. Moscow. Mm. And Yuri, just a follow up to that, Zelensky said that Ukraine has taken full control of Suja, the largest Russian town to fall to Ukraine's forces since this incursion. Can you put that into perspective for us? Well, you see that this gas controlling station is still functioning and it will function. Ukrainians, even conducting the war, are civilized. They are civilized. We keep the need of our European partners in attention, and we will never destroy this gas station. And uh, probably Russians will do that. I don't know, but we have no intention to uh, damage our European partners. Is European Union countries still have some contracts with Russia 
uh, and Russia is supplying gas via Ukrainian pipelines, and we will never damage Ukraine, uh, mm. European Union partners. Mm. That's for sure. Mm. And you see, we control this territory for several days, and it is functioning as it functioned before. Mm. Your Excellency, earlier this week, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church reported that Russian forces destroyed the Church of the Holy Martyr Cyprian in Ukraine. Are you anticipating more Russian attacks on Ukrainian Greek Catholic churches? And how are the faithful faring in the wake of that attack? Well, it's not only the, the Church of St. Cyprian. 600, uh, over 600 churches have been uh, damaged or destroyed in Ukraine of different uh, confessions. Uh, the Russian uh, missiles have been indiscriminate, hitting apartment buildings, shopping centers, train stations, uh, and uh, schools, hospitals, uh, churches. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Putin has spoken about the fact that Ukraine needs to be subdued and subsumed back into a uh, greater Russian Empire, and uh, he is showing uh, ruthlessness, utter brutality. His soldiers commit um, war crimes. There are crimes against humanity, uh, and there is no reluctance. Unfortunately, the Russian Orthodox Church and Patriarch Kirill have uh, deemed this a holy war. They use jihadist language. Uh, about martyrs, your sins will be forgiven if you die going into Ukraine to basically kill kill people. Uh, so there there should be absolutely no question about Putin's mm. attentions, uh, intentions and his methods. Mm. Just to follow up on that, Your Excellency, there you are on the ground in Ukraine. You've visited many times. How are the Ukrainian people and specifically our brother and sister Catholic Ukrainians doing two and a half years into the war, and what are you hearing from the faithful, and is there a boost in morale since this latest incursion? Uh, Ukrainians are wounded, but not uh, broken. Uh, they're very tired, but, uh, you know, when uh, the question is uh, death or life, you continue living on the adrenaline to survive. Uh, this has been a boost in morale. Uh, this is, it, it, brings to the fore again that Putin is not all powerful. And it seems that the Ukrainians are the only ones who don't fear Putin. Everybody else worries about what he will do. Well, he's already doing it. And Ukrainians are responding and they will continue to respond. Mm. Yuri, do you think Ukraine's seizure of more than 100 Russian POWs could be used to get Ukrainian POWs back home? Well, the number of uh, POW is increasing. Uh, actually, we have more than 2,000 already, and uh, we hope that the exchange of POW can be done. But unfortunately, there is specific uh, way of thinking of uh, Putin's military they do not accept the idea we offered once mm -hmm. uh, some time ago to exchange all for all. But I hope we will get some good news in a few days. Mm. We pray so as well. Your Excellency, do you believe if Pope Francis were to visit Ukraine, it would help to bring about peace and help to bring an end to this war? Well, I think Pope Francis has gone to places where there's pain where there's marginalization, uh, where there's suffering. You know, in a country where uh, 13 million people have been forced from their homes, eight of them outside of the country originally, now, now there's six million outside of the country and two have come back. I don't know where there is more suffering. Uh, nobody has a monopoly on suffering or virtue or vice, but uh, I think it would be a real sign of uh, uh, the Bishop of Rome mm -hmm. it coming, coming to the place where there is great human pain and where Catholics are under great danger. Yuri, we have less than a minute left. So quickly, for those of us outside of Ukraine, the reality of the ongoing war can feel distant and removed from our everyday. What do you want our viewers to know about the present moment in Ukraine right now? Well, outsiders 
of Ukraine, those uh, our partners and non-partners should understand the nature of this war. Russia want to become great again. They want to become one day an opposite pole in the geopolitics they used to be during the Cold War. And they lost their status and they want the revenge. And to become Russia great empire again, that means they have to destroy Ukraine, not to occupy Ukrainian territory, but to destroy Ukrainian nation. And they told this openly. Even Patriarch Kirill told that there is no such Ukrainian mm. nation. There is part of Russian nation, which is a historical fake. Mm. Well, gentlemen, we thank you both for your time and for the insight you brought us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will continue to monitor the stunning developments in the Russia-Ukraine war in the weeks and months to come. Next, we celebrate America's successful showing in the Summer Olympics with a discussion about some of the highlights, the athletes, and the importance of faith in sports when we are joined here in studio by a legendary Olympic gold medalist. After hosting thousands of athletes and awarding hundreds of medals, Paris ended the 2024 Olympic Games last Sunday with a bang. An energetic Team USA celebrated a job well done as it prepared to bring home more than 100 medals. At the end of the fanfare, Paris passed on the torch to the next host for the Summer Games, Los Angeles, California in 2028. This year's Summer Olympic Games proved to be a memorable event from start to finish, and Team USA proved once again it can go for the gold, topping the overall medal chart for the eighth consecutive games with 126 medals. These are just a few of Team USA's winning moments. Swimmer Katie Ledecky became the most decorated U.S. female Olympian by blowing the world record for the 1,500-meter swim out of the water. Noah Lyles won the men's 100-meter final by just five thousandths of a second, one of the closest races in Olympic history. America's gymnasts stole the show on social media. Steven Nedaroshik, known online as the Pummel Horse Guy, helped men's gymnastics earn its first medal in years. And Simone Biles, the most decorated gymnast in history now, kicked off the women's gymnastics team's redemption tour, clinching three gold and one silver. With the successful completion of the Summer Olympics in Paris, the focus now turns to Los Angeles, where the Summer Games will be held in 2028. L.A. Mayor Karen Bass returned to California on Monday, bringing with her the Olympic flag. She and other organizers were in Paris to learn what it will take to pull off the world's largest sporting event. Prayers and faith carried many of the athletes through the competition, including those who left Paris without a medal. USA Beach Volleyball player Taryn Cloth, who is Catholic, told EWTN News In Depth she was devastated when she and teammate Kristen Nuss were knocked out in the round of 16. But she prayed the surrender novena to get her through challenging times. She also wore a unique symbol of faith, which her mother had made for her with the Olympic rings and depictions of her favorite saints. Joan of Arc, who was my confirmation saint, she She's just a fighter, and I absolutely love that. Um, also has French ties. Mary, she has just been like an unbelievable blanket of love and nurturing that um, I really did like need more than I thought. Taryn is just one of several Olympians we talked to, each telling us what a blessing and privilege it was to compete in the Games. Our next guest has a special insight into that as well. Dominique Dawes is an Olympic gold medalist and three-time Olympian. Known as Awesome Dawesome, you may remember Dawes from the 92 Barcelona Games, the 96 Atlanta Games, as part of the gold-winning Magnificent Seven team, and the 2000 Sydney Games. Dawes was the first African-American gymnast to win an Olympic gold medal. Today, Dawes is a Catholic wife and mother of four young children who owns and runs the Dominique Dawes Gymnastics and Ninja Academies in the Washington, D.C. area. Dominic, it is an honor to have you in studio with us today. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Really appreciate it. I'd first love to get your take on some Olympic news items while we have you here. Uh, American gymnast Jordan Childs has been stripped of her bronze medal because the Court of Arbitration for Sports says her on-floor appeal came four seconds too late. What do you make of this whole situation, Dominique, and, and especially the position that Jordan is in right now? 
this is definitely an emotional roller coaster for any athlete that would be involved in a situation like this. Jordan Childs needs to know she did the best floor routine that she could ever do. Where What it comes down to is human error. A judge missed the difficulty value of a particular dance element that would have increased her score by one-tenth of a point. The head coach, Cecil, went over. She appealed it. The appeal was accepted. And then Jordan was awarded a bronze medal. She got to take part in the Olympic medal ceremony with her teammate, uh, Simone Biles, as well as the champion from Brazil. Mm -hmm. However, shortly after that, that's when she was then told that, hey, there's an issue and we're going to strip you of your bronze medal. It's unfortunate because she did the best job that she could. It really just came down to human error. Human error. Another headline from the summer game, Simone Biles, now the most decorated gymnast in history. She's called this her redemption uh, following the 2021 Tokyo Games where she famously, you know, pulled out and was criticized. What's your take on Simone's performance this summer, especially after she took time away to prioritize her mental health, and you know what it's like to have the world watching you. I completely do. I remember marching out at the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia, and I had a bit of an emotional breakdown because I truly did feel the weight of the world on my shoulders. I am so proud of Simone Biles. She competed fully in her third Olympic Games, and I'm the last female athlete to do that in the sport of gymnastics 24 years ago. And I love the fact that she's calling it her redemption mm -hmm. because in 2021, everyone got on her because she did pull out for mental health related reasons, didn't fully compete in those Olympic Games and people didn't truly believe that she had the resiliency or the perseverance to come back for a third. And I hate to put it out there, but she has the ability to come back for a fourth Olympic Games in LA 2028 on American soil. How sweet would that be? Oh my goodness. We'll just have to wait and see yeah. four years from now. You know, Dominique, I understand that you've been Christian your whole life, but you entered into the Catholic Church shortly after you retired from gymnastics. What first drew you into the Catholic faith? Well, I was raised Baptist, and I remember going to church every Sunday with my mom as well as with my siblings. And she, my mom was a Sunday school teacher, and we would walk to church every Sunday. Then when the sport of gymnastics started taking over my life, I ended up moving in with my coach, and I was not able to practice my faith. And then when I became a young adult, I kind of gravitated toward an interdenominational faith. However, I always felt a little incomplete and maybe misdirected. And I remember going to St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Rockville, and just sitting in the church in complete silence, which I completely love. I love when things are silent at times so I could truly listen to him. And I felt called to go into the Catholic faith. And that calling, I think, truly came from my grandmother, who was Catholic, was not able to practice her faith. And that is why I chose St. Kateri Tekawitha as my, um, as my faith when I came into the church, because that is the first Native American um, saint, and my grandmother was Piscataway Kanoi Native American, and so that was in honor of my grandmother as well. Oh my goodness, I'm sure she's just, you know, smiling down I know. on you. Yeah. Um, and you have been public, Dominique, about your affection for someone very dear to yeah. us, EWTN yeah. foundress Mother Angelica. In fact, back in 2016, you told the New York Times, if you could have dinner with <laughs> one person no longer with us, it would be Mother Angelica, I want to read to you some of what you said. You said, quote, over dinner, I'd be fascinated to hear from Mother Angelica about how she channeled her own pain to a larger purpose. And I would ask her how I might help others, whether they suffer from anxiety, depression, addiction, physical ailments, or the pain of abandonment or divorce. Her whole life, after all, was dedicated to helping others, especially the disenfranchised. Can you say more on that, Dominique? How does Mother Angelica inspire you? Well, I would say that I just heard from Father John Paul that she had a choleric personality, mm -hmm. was very gritty, and a, had a great deal of zest for life. And that's really what it's about, is having that gritty personality of never giving up or never taking no as the end answer in anything. And the fact that she started EWTN, and look how many billions and billions of people mm -hmm. that, that it's inspired and empowered throughout the globe. And yet, that was a dream that she had, and she knew it could be become a reality. I want to be that person that's got that fiery personality that she had and really sets the world on fire and helps inspire people and empower people. And I think at the end of the day, that's what is so important is that you know that you're going to leave a legacy behind and you want to make sure your legacy is one that helps lift up the world and not tear it down. You both are women of great resilience. Yeah. That, that is obvious to me. Dominique, you have reached the height of success for gymnastics. I mean, you have these incredible God-given <laughs> athletic abilities. When you look back at your time during the Olympics, how do you see that God was with you there and why do you think he gave you these great gifts? 
it was a journey and I think he gave me the gift so that I can inspire and plant seeds of inspiration in other people's lives. I didn't know it at the time. I always felt like I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders and many times in the journey it was a very dark experience in the sport of gymnastics. It can be very lonely. It's an individual sport. It's just me on that balance beam with nearly 40,000 people in the Georgia Dome watching and adding that level of pressure. However, it wasn't until I became a little older that I realized Christ was always by my side and even though I would make a mistake and I would falter and I would fail in the world's eyes, he was there to lift me up and it was always an opportunity for me to learn from those tough moments in life. I always believe that pain serves a greater purpose. It leads mm. to your passion and it allows you to make a greater impact and so any pain that I've gone through in my athletic career or my personal life, I really do look at it and I offer it up and recognize that this is an opportunity for growth in my character because I know I am a flawed human being and there's always an opportunity for me to be a better person and that's how I view pain today. That's so beautiful. That's so well said. And today you own and operate a gymnastics academy, multiple locations not far here mm -hmm. in the Washington DC area. What do you try to instill into these young athletes today and how does your faith inform that? Well, I will say it's so exciting to know that I've now brought in partners to allow me to scale this business. I have three academies at this time and my husband and I, Jeff Thompson, we opened our first academy July 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of work, a lot of grit, a lot of resiliency and a lot of sacrifice. And now we are at three academies. We've just brought in partners to help us kind of build our management team, get more support in operations, just so I don't burn out as being a CEO. I'm stepping away and becoming more of a brand ambassador so I can be out in the community more and give back to those that we are trying to serve. And so this is going to be an exciting journey and it really does allow me to spend more time with my faith, mm -hmm. with my husband and with my four kids. And I always said at the end of the day, if I'm not focused on what matters most and I need to learn to step away and step back just a little bit and that's what I'm going to be doing but it's also going to allow the business to scale and leave a greater impact. It's beautiful. We only have about a minute left but I did want to ask you this. You know as Catholics we strive to be saints, to be excellent in virtue and it's a battle every day and I wonder as a Catholic Olympian if you have an insight into just the hard work, the discipline and level of excellency that is required on this spiritual journey we're all on. I don't know, you know, like it reminds me right now what you were just saying, it reminds me of striving for that perfect 10 and I always tell people if you strive for a perfect 10, you will fail. There's only one individual that will always be a perfect 10. And so the sport of gymnastics taught me to strive for, for, for perfection and also to compare myself to others. And what I do each and every day, when I wake up, before putting my feet on the ground, I drop down immediately to my knees. I don't ask for more academies, I don't ask for more speaking engagements or television opportunities or statues or accolades. I ask for his will to be done because I know that he knows what's most important for me to pursue in my life. And I ask him to open my eyes, open my ears and to control my tongue because I know how powerful words can be. And so that is really what I think Catholics, Catholic mm -hmm. Olympians, you know, should strive for is not to strive for perfection or to make this great difference. You know, you can make the great difference in your household. And that's what I try to focus on with my marriage, with my amazing husband, Jeff Thompson, who's been a school teacher for nearly 20 years and has inspired more kids than I ever would be able to do, or my four beautiful kids, Kateri, oh. Quinn, Lincoln, and Dakota. Those are my gold medals. Those oh. are my, those are the reasons why I want to be a better person. I want to be a better mom and I want to make a greater difference. Well, well, you're doing just that. Thank you. Dominique Dawes, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. A lot of them haven't been on many funerals, if any, and they often don't have the words, but their presence is enough. When we come back, lessons of life and death, how the corporal works of mercy are influencing some teenagers to become a man for others. I'm Colin Flynn and I've come to the small town of Bobbio in the north of Italy to follow in the footsteps of one of the great Irish saints, Saint Columbanus. We'll tell you why a saint who lived more than 1500 years ago is still impacting modern politics today. many ways Catholic youth are giving back to the church community, from service inside the sanctuary to public outreach on the streets of a city. Teenagers are stepping up to contribute. Today, a look at a more unusual ministry, which our research found active in just a handful of Catholic high schools across America. Roselle Regis traveled to Cleveland, Ohio, to be with some young men as they attended a funeral in this Catholic Life Report.
a ministry of presence and prayer. I think pallbearers, you know, at the center of it really embodies community. These young high school students carry men and women to their final resting place. The pallbearers ministry to me is kind of a place to to serve others and uh, also serve yourself. This is the St. Joseph of Arimathea Paul Bearer Ministry at St. Ignatius High School in Cleveland, Ohio. Pat Valletta serves as the school's coordinator of programs and volunteers and is one of two Paul Bearer moderators. Being open to the call, being willing to serve, uh, to be present, to be prayerful for the family during their time of need. 21 years strong, the Paul Bearer Ministry was founded by the late theology teacher Jim Squirrel, who wanted students to live out the corporal works of mercy. The way the Paul Bearer Ministry started was he called um, a funeral director too that he knew and asked if there was a need in any capacity and basically discovered through conversations with a couple of funeral directors that um, there are oftentimes families and funerals that don't have people to serve as pallbearers. Named after St. Joseph of Arimathea, in honor of the saint who assumed responsibility for the burial of Jesus after his crucifixion, the service is offered free of charge to indigent people, small families, or those who die alone. It's kind of the, the mission, the purpose behind it. Juniors and seniors at St. Ignatius are invited each year to be trained and to serve. Before the end of the school year, interested sophomores attend a presentation on the Paul Bearer Ministry. I signed up because I want to just help people. I want to get out there. I want to do what I can to make the world a better place. I think it's cool that like us as high school students are right, given the opportunity to like be of service to others in such a massive way. I've lost a lot of family members of my own, and I know this time can be extremely difficult for many people, especially the funeral service itself. So. I just want to be able to help these people in any way I can. For senior and student leader in the Paul Bearer Ministry, Fitzwilliam Lockich, the ministry is much more than service. By them going there and being there for somebody else, in their time of need, I can kind of help them to understand that I have this, you know, Catholic community behind me who is committed to helping me through acts of service or just by being there for me and praying for me. Lockich is just one of the more than 400 students who make up the Paul Bearer Ministry. As a student leader, we organize the funerals, um, and that consists of reaching out to other students to staff the funerals. Um, typically, it's six Paul Bearers. Jonathan Merriman Velez was the student leader in charge of the funeral for this day. In the morning, he and his friends gathered with the moderators for a short briefing where they found out that the deceased was an elderly man with a small family. After saying prayer in the chapel, they made their way to the van. At the church, the pallbearers met the family members and accompanied the casket throughout Mass, exemplifying their ministry of prayer and presence. I think pallbearers has helped me to kind of look at grief from a different perspective as both as I'll experience grief in my life and being a companion to those who experience grief, like standing in solidarity with um, whoever it may be. At the cemetery, the boy stayed until the end, offering a condolence card to a family member. Rachel Bauman, granddaughter of the departed, thanked the pallbearers for serving dutifully. I wouldn't know who would be able to do it if they weren't available. It's it's very nice for them to do that service and, and they all looked professional and I I think that it was just really great they could do that. They cared enough to come and make it nice for us. I think Grandpa would be really happy. It's an honor that we have this privilege to, to be with them um, at, at the end of their life um, and to, uh, to celebrate their life and to, to mourn their passing. Um, and to rejoice in their homecoming. Paul Bearer moderator and theology teacher Joe Maholland explains the connection between the church's teachings on the dignity of human life and this ministry. This is a ministry fundamentally about death, but paradoxically, it's 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 a fundamentally pro-life ministry because this is this is really communicating that all human life is is sacred. The Paul Bearer ministry started here at Saint Ignatius High School in 2003. Since then, the ministry has spread to more than 10 high schools in the area and is gaining momentum nationwide.
we serve, you know, over 100, 100 and 200 funerals a year, um, and it's caught on to other schools and communities all over the, the country, including some of the girls' schools. Graduating this year, Lockich says serving as a pallbearer will forever have a lasting impact on him. God takes care of all of us, and it's it almost just kind of reinforces that idea and shows it to you in kind of a practical way. Rasal Rages, EWTN News in Depth. Our thanks to St. Ignatius High School in Cleveland, Ohio, for allowing us to profile its St. Joseph of Arimathea Paul Bearer program. Again, a unique Catholic ministry, which we found in only about 10 high schools in America. We'll be back in a moment with the Week in Review. Encouraging economic numbers top the week in review. For the first time in three years, the consumer price index fell below 3%, indicating inflation may be coming under control. Wednesday's report from the Labor Department showed prices rose 2.9% in July from a year earlier, the smallest 12-month increase since March of 2021. Importantly, to help ease the financial burden, wages have risen faster than prices for 17 months. But lower inflation does not necessarily translate into lower prices, including at the grocery store where prices are flat. Much of the continuing increases came in higher rental costs and housing prices. The categories where prices declined included the cost of used vehicles, gas, medical care, airline tickets, and clothing. Economists say a benefit of this new inflation report is that it will give the Federal Reserve a green light to cut interest rates at its September meeting, making things more affordable from mortgages, credit cards, and car loans. The economy prices and their effect on the middle class are sure to be top of mind as American voters size up the presidential candidates, with the election less than three months away now. Both former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris delivered campaign speeches this week on the economy and other pocketbook issues. Trump spoke in Asheville, North Carolina, a must-win state key to his potential re-election. And in her first joint appearance with President Joe Biden since he exited the race, both Harris and the president announced the results of the administration's work to lower the cost of prescription drugs. The price discounts worked out after months of negotiations will knock hundreds of dollars off the list prices of 10 of Medicare's most popular and costliest drugs. Another key deciding point for voters will be the abortion issue. This week, both Arizona and Missouri officially added pro-abortion initiatives to the ballot. Turnout for those measures could also spike voting in presidential and congressional races. Voters in both states will decide whether to guarantee what is called a right to abortion with a constitutional amendment. Missouri currently protects life throughout all nine months of pregnancy, and Arizona allows abortion through the first 15 weeks. Both amendments would allow abortion until viability, around 24 weeks of gestation. In a notable development, Arizona's Supreme Court ruled on Wednesday that informational pamphlets for voters can refer to unborn human beings rather than use the term fetus. Missouri and Arizona join six other states in voting on abortion this coming election. Those states shown here in yellow are Nevada, South Dakota, New York, Maryland, Florida, and Colorado. Since the overturning of Roe versus Wade in 2022, pro-life advocates have seen ballot losses for life in six states, shown here in red. To help unpack this latest on these ballot initiatives, we're joined by someone who has studied and written about abortion law and policy for decades. Elizabeth Kirk serves as assistant professor of law and co-director of the Center for Law and the Human Person at the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law. Elizabeth, welcome. First things first, does having an abortion amendment in the state constitution ultimately make it harder for voters to pass strong pro-life laws in the future if they were to decide to do so? Yes, first of all, thanks for having me to discuss this important question. Um, absolutely, these amendments make it difficult for citizens to pass really any restrictions or regulations on abortion. Um, but I would say they have a twofold significant legal effect. One is to um, create the conditions under which it's likely that any existing laws would be struck down. So many of these states that are considering abortion amendments have existing uh, sometimes quite moderate laws with respect to abortion, whether they're 
you know, accounting for parental, a parental role, informed consent, restrictions on public funding. And we know in states that adopt a state constitutional right to abortion that those get struck down. And then the next, you know, significant impact is, as you say, that there's a chilling effect on future uh, abortion regulation. Mm, that is so important to know. And Elizabeth, we have seen abortion amendments pass in state after state since the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Do you think voters even know exactly what they are voting for? Or are these amendments intentionally worded to be confusing, in your opinion? It's very discouraging, uh, I'll admit that. I think whether they're intended to be confusing, the reality is that they are confusing. Um, as you mentioned, we lost four of these since Dobbs. Uh, we also lost two amendments in Kansas and Kentucky that would have just made the constitutions neutral with respect to abortion. And we have eight on the ballot this year, and you know none of them are a sure, a sure thing. I think they the language is confusing for a couple of reasons. One, it's legal language, and so that's not always accessible yeah. you know, to most voters. Um, and then also it's intending to capture a very, uh, you know, um, difficult legal question, mm -hmm. right? All of the nuances, all of the hard cases and things like that. And so the language doesn't easily capture that. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, whether or not it's actually intended to be confusing, is that the abortion industry exploits that confusion, that natural language confusion to their advantage. Mm -hmm. They frame these amendments as sort of moderate, right? Just protecting autonomy. They use rhetoric like restoring Roe. And they they scare voters that the alternative, if these aren't passed, is that, you know, women are going to go to jail for having a miscarriage or contraception will be banned or, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so voters think they have this very difficult decision. And when faced with that difficult decision, they tend to vote for abortion access. Yeah. What they don't realize is that these amendments protect unlimited, unregulated access to abortion mm -hmm. throughout pregnancy at taxpayer expense. And that's not something most Americans support. Right. And that goes obviously beyond what Roe allowed. Elizabeth, what impact do these abortion amendments have on the number of U.S. abortions? The abortion rate has gone up since Dobbs. Yeah, I mean, the case I always like to give is Kansas because Kansas is in the heartland. A lot of people think of it as a relatively moderate state. And in that state, when its state court adopted a natural right to abortion, um, abortions in that state went from under 7,000 to this year, they're going to be nearly 20,000 abortions mm -hmm. in just a few years. Um, before that state Supreme Court decision, there were four abortion clinics in the state. Uh, I saw news reports that a seventh is being added this year. Uh, so it's an abortion destination state. So we see what the impact of these of these amendments is, is explosive growth in the number of abortions. Mm. I have less than a minute with you now, Elizabeth, but I did want to ask proponents of these abortion amendments in Missouri and Arizona say it allows for abortions up until fetal viability. Is there even a legal definition of fetal viability? So fetal viability is ordinarily understood to be the time when a child can survive outside the womb. And those provisions do purport to limit abortion after viability. The problem is that those amendments are extremely vague. Um, they leave the question of whether the child is viable up to the discretion of the abortionist, first of all. Second of all, they contain exceptions for the woman's mental health, which as we know from other cases in other states, is an exception that really swallows the rule. So again, that's another example of political rhetoric uh, you know, a reasonable limit at viability being used to mask the reality. Mm. Elizabeth Kirk, so grateful for your insight. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Thank you. Demolition crews have torn down a Baptist church in Texas where the deadliest church shooting in U.S. history took place. Heavy machinery flattened the building on Monday, though the decision to tear it down has been years in the making. A gunman opened fire on the worshipers at First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs in 2017, killing 26 people, including a pregnant mother and her unborn baby. Since then, the community has moved to a new sanctuary. Church members voted to tear the church down in 2021, but some wanted to keep the building as a memorial for those lives lost.
The contract for what would have been the first religious charter school in the country has been rescinded. The Oklahoma Statewide Charter School Board nullified the contract for St. Isidore of Seville Catholic Virtual School on Monday. The state Supreme Court ruled the school unconstitutional in June. The school board says it will immediately reinstate the contract with St. Isidore's if a higher court nullifies the state court's ruling. Churches around the world celebrated the solemnity of Mary's Assumption body and soul into heaven. In northwest Nicaragua, Catholics celebrated Gratiria Chiquita, a popular festival that commemorates when a 20th century bishop and a group of pilgrims implored Our Lady of the Assumption to halt a volcanic eruption. Dozens of Spaniards in Salamanca donned traditional costumes for a centuries-old tradition centered around the Blessed Mother. And in Paris, not far from where the Olympic Games took place just last week, Catholics processed through the streets with a statue of Our Lady. And just in time for the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary this week, a reopening of the baths at the Marian Shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes in France. For the first time in four years, full immersion in the sacred water is now possible again for those seeking healing. The baths were closed during the pandemic and then for renovation. Our Lady of Lourdes is one of the most visited religious shrines in the world. The waters are renowned for their healing powers. Doctors on the International Medical Committee of Lourdes have certified 70 medical cures from the spring water in the past 160 years. Columbanus set the seeds in his own day for a united Europe because of his faith, because of his culture, and because of his unflagging work for peace. Next, a medieval Irish missionary and his writings serve as a model for current day politics. A history lesson about this revered Irish saint when we return. Finally today, at a time of division and dissension around much of the globe, we travel to Italy to see an example of Catholic unity at work. Today's modern day European Union has roots in the earthly legacy of an Irish saint whose vast impact remains with us more than 1,500 years after his death. The story from correspondent Colin Flynn. I'm here in the north of Italy, about to cross the historic Ponte Vecchio Bridge, heading towards the town of Bobbio. And I've come here to walk in the footsteps of one of the great Irish saints, Saint Columbanus. Nestled in the Tribia Valley, the town of Bobbio retains much of its medieval character, with narrow cobblestone streets, stone buildings, and a number of historical landmarks. But what the town is most famous for is its association with St. Columbanus. In the middle of the town is the Abbey of Bobbio, founded by the Irish monk in 614 AD. And under the chapel, in the crypt, is Columbanus' grave. Where a group of Columban brothers and priests and nuns and pilgrims have come together to celebrate Mass and remember the life of their founding saint. We gather at his tomb. This is the 25th annual meeting of Columban religious orders. The heritage of Columbus is not simply an exercise of historical memory. But who was this Irish saint who established monasteries throughout Europe and is credited by some as being one of the inspirations behind the founding of the European Union? Isn't it beautiful, Bobbio? Dr. Damien Bracken is a senior lecturer at the School of History at University College Cork. Damien, who was Columbanus? Uh, Columbanus was an Irish monk who left Ireland probably around the year 595, 91. When he was in comfortable middle age, he could have coasted into a comfortable retirement, but he packed it all in and he journeyed off into what was then the unknown. Columbanus went on an epic journey across the continent at a time of deep division in Europe and also in the Catholic Church. He wanted to promote unity and so wrote to people at the highest levels in the church and in society, demanding a higher standard of leadership. He even wrote to the Pope. He went to France where he established three monasteries and then headed south. And he works his way down through Central Europe 
into what's now Switzerland. He crosses the Alps in about 612 and he arrives in this part of the world and he writes his last letter in 613, his masterpiece. The monasteries he established became beacons of monastic life and learning. So what he does is he establishes three monasteries in the Vosges Mountains in what we now call France. And this is his last foundation, Bobbio. So we know of four for definite, but his legacy is contained in his monastic rule. He left a blueprint on how to run a monastery um, in his monastic rule. And of course, these monasteries produce um, graduates and they go on to found other monasteries. They bring Columbanus's message with them. So a century after he dies, across Western Europe, there are about a hundred monasteries which have been influenced by his ideas. When he arrived here in Bobbio, he established his final monastery, which quickly became one of the most important monastic centers in medieval Europe. It had a vast library with manuscripts preserved from the Dark Ages. It becomes a very important center of learning uh, for this whole region in, 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 in Northern Italy. It has a very significant library, is stocked with books, some of the manuscripts come, coming from Ireland, some of the earliest ir surviving Irish manuscripts. He may have been heading for Rome, but never left Bobbio and died here in 615 AD. What happens here after Columbanus dies is his monks are anxious to secure his legacy. So they go to Rome and the Pope of the time says this monastery can continue in existence without any outside interference. So it's, it's given a free reign to grow and to develop. And this monastery sets down a marker for the future because in, a tro in troubled times, and Europe was to go through centuries of troubled times, the fixed centers, the centers of stability were monasteries. So this monastery was absolutely very, very important. Father Michal McGrath is a Franciscan friar and guardian of St. Isidore's College in Rome. He has studied the life of St. Columbanus, impressed by his deep desire for a united Europe. Columbanus is the first person we know in history that used the phrase Totsius Europe, all Europe. And he wrote it, he wrote it on two occasions, one in a letter to Pope Boniface to, and another in a letter to Gregory the Great. One in the year 600, one in the year 613. And in another letter where he didn't use the term all of Europe, but he said, whether we are Franks or British or Irish or others, we are all one people under God. 1400 years of intrepid faith, of pastoral care, of putting an end to violence and creating peace among diverse peoples. That you cannot have a united Europe and deny its Christian roots. Robert Schumann, the founder of the European Union, used the legacy of St. Columbanus as one of his inspirations for establishing the Union. And because of that, an exhibition was unveiled in Bobbio, marking the birth of Europe. I am delighted that the exhibition has found a new home here in Bobbio. Helping to launch it was Francis Collins, the Irish ambassador to the Holy See. For the Irish government last year, we celebrated 50 years of Ireland's membership of the European Union. But of course, our legacy and our identification with Europe goes back much further. And St. Columbanus is evident of that. Um, and that's why we wanted to acknowledge that long association. It's incredible that connection, isn't it, between St. Columbanus and the founding of the very European Union. Yes, indeed, Colum. St. Columbanus, of course, was the first to speak of and use the phrase of all of Europe. And when Robert Schumann um, was meeting in Luxel in 1950, he identified St. Columbanus as the patron saint of European unity. So it's very much something that we in Ireland should be proud of and as the Irish government, we are proud of. To mark 25 years of Columban's Day, a special dinner is held for the pilgrims, where the music, the food, and the wine is flowing. Many of the pilgrims have been walking for days to get here, following in the footsteps of St. Columbanus. 
I think one of my main attractions to Colin Ban is, is his prayerful life. Um, and reading his sermons and his letters, I just find it absolutely amazing, the experience that he had of God. I think his legacy is that he, his message was for all time. You know, we must respect other people's cultures, other people's way of doing things. Uh, diversity is important, but we can also be unified within that. And I think uh, that's a message for all time and especially for now uh, in Europe and in the world. In Bobbio, Italy, Colum Flynn, EWTN News in Debt. Our thanks to column and videographer Patrick Leonard. And this somber note, in that report, Patrick captured video of Irish prelate Archbishop Noel Trainer as he presided at Mass. Sadly, the Archbishop died suddenly last Sunday of a heart attack at the age of 73. Pope Francis appointed Trainer as the Apostolic Nuncio to the European Union and granted him the title of Archbishop. He had served in that role since January 2023. His death was greeted with shock in Ireland, where he was ordained a priest and eventually became this bishop of the Diocese of Down and Connor. The Irish Catholic Bishops Conference said Trainer as Nuncio was dedicated to helping nourish the heart and soul of Europe. Our prayers here at EWTN for Archbishop Trainer's eternal rest. Thank you for joining us for EWTN News in Depth. I'm Catherine Hadro. We hope to see you again same time next week for more news and reports important to your Catholic life. Until then, God bless.